This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. The greatest sin in our culture is to be seen to constrain anyone from being who they really are. Now, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, let's just get it out there. Jesus says not express yourself, you do you or you be you. Jesus says deny yourself. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines, pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. Hi, and welcome to Today with Jeff Vines. In this episode, we have another message from the series called Jesus Resolution. If you miss any, you can find all messages in this series on your podcast app. We're partway through. Here's Pastor Jeff to finish today's message. Every Disney movie in the last 10 years, and I, I, don't, I know I'm picking on Disney lately, but every Disney movie in the last 10 years if you look at the theme, it, it seems like it's all the same. You've got to be true to yourself. And that's a very Western way of thinking. In fact, Mulan, it was set in China. And Disney was thinking when they made and produced this movie that China has a massive market. Let's set one of our movies in a Chinese cultural context. Uh, there's going to be mass revenue from that. It's a second largest market on the planet. So let's get on on some of that action. Let's, let's produce something, let's direct something. Let's come up with something that specifically attracts the Chinese audience. Well, I don't know if you've read this, but they ran smack dab into a problem because the message of the movie was this, hey, be true to yourself. Even if people, other people don't get you, you got to be true to yourself. Well, the problem is that's not part of Chinese culture. If you're doing that in Eastern culture, you're seen to be a self-aggrandizing, narcissistic little jerk. Life is not about the individual in the East, but the community. It's not all about you, but it's about your family and your community and not bringing shame upon them and what is ultimately best for them. So you do you may not be a good idea. What if you isn't very nice and you is unforgiving and that's just your tendency? What if you is so driven that you just run over anybody who gets in your way? But the greatest sin in our culture is to be seen to constrain anyone from being who they really are. Now, if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, let's just get it out there. Jesus says not express yourself, you do you or you be you. Jesus says deny yourself. In other words, there are going to be times and situations where you're going to say a profound no to some of your deepest longings, deepest ambitions, your strongest yearnings and intuitions. That's what taking up your cross ultimately means. Jesus doesn't just invent this phrase out of thin air. It's already in operation in the Greco-Roman world. Jesus employs that phrase to show what it really means to follow him. So when you were sentenced to be crucified, you would take up your cross and you'd be led to the place of execution where they would crucify you. But from the moment the Romans put the cross beam on your back, you forfeited your life. You were stripped of all your rights. Actually, that happened as soon as you were declared guilty. So as they were leading you through the streets of the city out to the place of execution, people were allowed to say or do anything they wanted to you without penalty. Because you had been, you've picked up your cross. You've died to yourself. You have no rights. You have nothing. You're not even a per you, it, You've given up everything to Rome. And that's why when we read in Matthew 27, do you remember what Jesus experienced? In verse 27 of chapter 27, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. Now, now what would one Jewish carpenter, what, what threat does one Jewish carpenter bring against an entire battalion? So this is 600 men minimal. Okay, probably more. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes and led him away to be crucified. The point is, of all the images 
that Jesus could have just decided to employ in describing what it is to be a disciple. He says, hey guys, discipleship is going to look like you taking up your cross. You forfeit your life to God. You yield your entire life to Jesus. All your rights and self-determination ends. However, and this is a big however, because there's another verse in that passage, when you lose your life to Rome, nothing good happens. But when you lose your life to Christ, remember what the next verse says? For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So Jesus is saying where disciples are concerned, there's going to be a time in your life in discipleship where it feels like Jesus is killing you. He's saying following me is going to feel like you're losing your life. And yet, the weird thing is, you may feel like you're losing it, but in all actuality, you're gaining it. You're getting the real you. The very act of yielding ourselves to Jesus is the means by which we discover who we really are. Jesus says, don't do you, do Jesus. And as a pastor, I'm always trying to figure out how I can communicate this beautiful truth. The beautiful paradox of the Christian life is this. As you deny yourself and follow Jesus, you become the true you that God thought up in the first place. See, every time you violate a precept of the rabbi, every time you refuse to walk in the dust of the rabbi, remember these, these precepts are objective. You lose. You lose. If, if, if you refuse to walk in his path, you're not gaining yourself. You're losing the self that God intended in the beginning. So that the process of discipleship is to sharpen you. Again, you're the, you're the potter on the potter's, or you're the clay on the potter's wheel. He's forming and shaping you to become what God envisioned you becoming before you were even in your mother's womb. Which is why as a disciple, you're constantly asking yourself good questions like, where am I going that I shouldn't be going? What am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? What am I pursuing I should not be pursuing? What am I looking at that I should not be looking at? What does God want me to let go of that I'm holding on to? And what should I be holding on to that I'm tempted to let go of? It's a crucial question. When you came to Jesus, did you realize this is what you were doing? You were giving up your rights, your desires, and your pursuits over to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I follow you. Whatever rights you give me, I take. Whatever desires you created me, I welcome. Whatever you want me to pursue, ultimately, I will pursue. This is called discipleship. And it's often a painful process because there's a great cost to it. And few will be willing to pay it. So first, discipleship is a non-negotiable. Second, discipleship is full on. Third, discipleship is costly. Quickly now, discipleship is missional. Discipleship is missional. In Matthew 28, the famous passage, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now, this entire passage is basically structured around four alls, A-L-L. -L. And in case we missed it, the first one is all authority. That is, Jesus has all authority. And, just, and if we misunderstand, he says, in heaven and earth. So that about covers it. Jesus is saying everything belongs to him. Every person belongs to him. Everything belongs to him. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. It's Jesus' way of saying, I'm the boss of you. I am your boss. I am your master. But I'm, a, but I'm a kind and gentle master. And I'm the master. When you serve this master, you gain everything. You lose your life to me. You gain it all. You gain both heaven and earth. But if we are to consider the fact that everything belongs to Jesus, then everything everywhere belongs to him. And that means that Jesus must have a, a, a genuine concern for every place on this planet and every person on this planet. And because you and I are walking in the dust of the rabbi, that's the calling on our lives as disciples as well, that we would have passion and compassion and concern for every person, every place, at home, at school, in the coffee shops, in every part of this world. 
That's what it means to be a disciple. And our job, as you know by the passage, is we're supposed to go into all the world, that's another one of the alls, and make disciples. Now, as soon as I say that, I know that it strikes a lot of guilt in people's lives because they think, well, this is a real burden. I don't know how to do that, and I've not had a good experience, and yet here you are telling me that if I'm truly a disciple of Jesus, that I'll be making disciples of others. Well, it's only a burden to you because you, you don't yet understand how this happens. This should be one of the most enjoyable experiences of our lives, not a burden at all. To a religious person, they may see it as a burden, but a Christ follower actually sees it as a luxury, not as an obligation, but as a beautiful, wonderful opportunity. Listen, everyone here listening and in the room, at one time or another, we were all spiritual orphans, separated from God by sin and shame and guilt, deserving judgment, not grace. But the good news of the gospel that Jesus came to bring is that God sent Him, His Son, to bring us home that God may grab our face in his hands and tell us we are the one he wants and we are the apple of his eye. And the thing about God is he does that with everyone. He owns everyone and everything everywhere. And it's not his desire, according to the scripture, that anyone should perish, but that we would all have everlasting life. And I got to tell you, I am weary of people telling me that the world is too far gone and there's nothing that we can do, that it's impossible to reach those who are far from God. But isn't that the point? It is not us reaching them. It's God reaching down to all of us. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Can I show you something? In Mark chapter 13, go over to chapter 13, verse 9. He's talking to the disciples and he says, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. Again, another passage about the cost of discipleship. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. The point here is that we are not converters, we're conduits through whom the Holy Spirit works. See, when you start to get that, yes, your calling as a disciple is first and foremost to live a life of distinction that will compel others. So if you're not ready to start there, your effectiveness uh, as being sought in light and compelling people into relationship with Jesus is going to be severely limited. Second, our job is to pray that others will have the Jesus revelation that we've had so that they can see the truth of the gospel. And then to be ready in season and out of season to give a reason for the hope that is within us when God presents us with the opportunity. Part of the reason fewer and fewer people are considering Christ in the West, not in other places, by the way. Christianity is exploding in other places, but in the West, part of the reason is because there are fewer true disciples whose lives are noticeably different. Just like he promised his disciples in Mark chapter 13. Jesus says all authority. Jesus has authority in every place. All nations. We dare not stop at our shores. Obeying all I have commanded you in this. A disciple is someone who obeys all Jesus has commanded you. Now say this with me in your mind. First, discipleship is non-negotiable. Discipleship is full on. Discipleship is costly. Discipleship is missional. Discipleship is responsive. Discipleship is a lifetime of investigation and commits to all that Jesus has commanded us to do. All of it. Not some, not most, just what you like, just what you agree with. No, all of it. And the process of discipleship is the discovery of all that Jesus has commanded us. It is to allow someone to teach and to guide us into the truth that Jesus actually teaches, not into the truth that we feel should be objective. In effect, to be a disciple is to say, Jesus commands this, therefore, this is what I am going to do. And when you come to a crossroads between culture and Jesus, you take the Jesus road, period. But part of that also means that following Jesus means that he comes first in everything. If we're a disciple of Jesus, it means he's at the center and everything else is now displaced. It's, it's not that the focus of my life is my career and I'm going to have a bit of Jesus on the side. That's not being a disciple. 
A disciple says, okay, from now on, Jesus, it doesn't mean I stop doing everything else. It just means that Jesus comes first in everything. He comes before everything else now, even the very best things in life. He comes before family, before livelihood, before security, before whatever identity I brought into my relationship with him. When it comes to being a disciple, whatever previously came first is now a very, very, very distant second. And we're living at a time, honestly, when so many of my friends have faded away from the gospel. Other things have now started to come first in people that I never thought it would happen. So, for instance, somebody who's been a Christ follower for most of their life, suddenly they meet someone they like, and they said, you know what, I choose sex before marriage. Because I, 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 this is before Christ. I, this is what I want. I'm going to do it. At that point, they're not saying, I want to walk in the dust of the rabbi. At that point, they're saying, I don't want to be a disciple anymore. I think many people discovered free time during COVID, and now they choose bed over Jesus. Now, I know that's going to hurt some people. But the reality is some of you got out of the habit, and suddenly you started thinking, you know, i got this free time. Remember, it's about you. I've got my free time, and I'd rather sleep in. So suddenly church takes a back seat. It's not that important to you anymore, and being around the people of God is not that important to you anymore. You've become a consumer now, okay? I just want to consume this without giving my life to it. It doesn't work like that. Some of my friends have found a new hobby or interest during COVID. A lot of people are on the golf course now. My friends, they said, you know what? I love golf and I'm just going to watch it when I get home in the afternoon. I'll sit down and watch it. And they, to them, watching a sermon is the same as discipleship. The problem is, make no mistake, when something starts to take priority over Jesus, it's not long until Jesus is completely pushed out. It's a very slippery slope. Apparently, during the Crusades, as some of the soldiers were baptized, they would go down into the river and some of them would hold their swords above the water as if to say, everything else is getting baptized, but not this part of my life. I'm keeping this sword in my arm above the water because Jesus, you can have everything else, but when it comes to this sword, I'm doing my thing. And I think that's the picture that many Christ followers have, that we're always tempted to hold something back from our discipleship, which means we're not a disciple at all. Because the process of discipleship is a lifetime of letting anything go that contradicts with walking in the dust of the rabbi and giving that thing over to God and seeking his kingdom first and then believing all other things will be added to you. Most people will say, I will follow Jesus, but... Now, right there, you're already sunk. There is no but. I will follow Jesus, they say, but I want to maintain my sexual identity. I want to maintain my own sexual ethic. I want to pursue my own pathway in life. I want to interpret the Bible my own way. I'm saying to you that part of the way that is narrow means that far too many people will come to Jesus and say, listen, Jesus, all of these areas of my life are open to you. You can have them. Look, come and look. I've prepared them for you. But this area over here, that belongs to me. I got to do things my own way. And that's why we have claimed Christ followers, disciples, participating in immorality, engaging in sex before marriage, sex outside of marriage, committing adultery and rationalizing about it, forsaking the assembly of God's people, seeking first the kingdom, their kingdom, and their own personal righteousness, and most of all, storing up treasures on the earth. That's right. The number one area, the number one area where people say, I'm not going to be a disciple, I'm not going to follow Jesus, is in our stuff, in our finances. Pastors know this. That's why they talk about it. And Jesus knows this. That's why he talked about it more than any other topic in the New Testament. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You're either a disciple of Jesus or a disciple of money. You either follow Jesus or you follow stuff. Man cannot serve both God and money. So when Jesus comes to you as your rabbi and says, I want you to invest your resources in something bigger than yourself, in, in this, in bringing the kingdom of earth, or the kingdom of heaven to the, to the kingdoms of earth, and you say no, then what you're basically saying is, I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. Jesus asks for nothing less than to come before everything else in your life, and Jesus is worthy of nothing less. My biggest fear is that one of, the, one of the most dangerous habits that we can get into as Christ followers is what I call delayed obedience. It's where you hear a message like this, 
and you take a good look at your life and you know there are things there and you say, you know what, Pastor Jeff, you're right. I've got these things. You know what? I'm not quite ready to give them up yet, but I can see in a few years I'll give them up. No, discipleship is both total and urgent. Total and urgent. The longer you delay, the chances decrease significantly of you ever given your life and following Christ. And then the day of judgment comes and accountability, and it's just too late. It's always worth us asking, which voices in the world are we giving our priorities to? Who are we listening to? What are we pursuing? What are we chasing after? What are we committed to hearing? Who do I distinctively and instinctively want to please and obey rather than Jesus? Whose kingdom am I really building on this earth? Say it with me again. Discipleship is non-negotiable. Discipleship is full on. Discipleship is costly. Discipleship is missional. And discipleship is responsive. When I think of discipleship, and let me say again, there's no such thing as a Christian who's not a disciple. There's no such thing. You're either all in or you're not in at all. That does not mean that you're perfect and that you never sin. It simply means that the will is bent toward walking in the dust of the rabbi. And when the Holy Spirit illuminates something in your life that contradicts the teachings, the precepts, and the applications of your rabbi, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, you do a 180, you turn and you walk in the direction of Christ so that one day, together, we will all walk into eternity with him. As I said before, if you're not following Jesus on earth, what makes you think you're going to follow him into eternity? Every time I do a a series, like just quickly, in John 21, I love it when Jesus comes back to restore Peter. Peter's denied him three times, and now Jesus is meeting with the disciples. And I think the purpose of John 21, especially verse 15 through 21, is to remind us of Jesus' grace and mercy. But when he comes to Peter, he still reminds Peter of what it means to be a disciple. And as you look through the text, you learn that Jesus says, are you going to love me more than anything else? You're going to to pursue me more than anything else, even your own life? And of course, Peter says yes. And then Jesus says, good, because you're going to stretch out your hands and you're going to die and you're going to glorify me. After that, I think it's around verse 18 and 19, Jesus looks to Peter and says, Peter, follow me. And evidently in the text, the way it's written, Jesus turns and takes a step, but Peter doesn't follow. Instead, he looks to his, his friend John and says, well, what about John? What about this guy? In other words, if I'm going to pay the ultimate price for following you, what about John? Is his life going to be easy? And I love the sarcasm. Jesus returns a response by saying, basically, that's none of your business. He says, what is that to you? You worry about you, I'll worry about John. Now, this is, this is crucial in discipleship. The calling on our lives always to follow Jesus and to walk in the dust of the rabbi But the fact of the matter is, there is a unique, specific calling on all of us. And can I tell you, the greater the calling in the fact that God wants to accomplish, the greater thing that God wants to accomplish in you, the more difficult your life is going to be. So if you've not died to yourself, willing to give up your rights, your desires, your pursuits to Him, you may get into heaven. But can I tell you, you would have missed discovering who you really were And what God had in mind from the day he thought about you. And that would be the biggest tragedy of all. Father, thank you that you call us to discipleship. This is serious business. That there's no such thing as a Christ follower who is not a disciple. We are thankful for your grace and mercy that forgives us when we fail. And we know that we do. But we also know the intent of our will That's what matters most to you. Are we on a journey of discovery of your precepts and application so that we may walk in your will and word to compel those who are far from God to come near? Forgive us, help us. We say, I am, that's it. I'm turning around. I'm going to discover who I really am by walking in the dust of the rabbi. In Christ's name, amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. Love, you make-
Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.